four flex are in our seventh week of our course, Analysis of the Complex Type. This lecture will focus on new tricks to find residues. Now that we have a powerful residue theorem, we need new techniques to find residues more easily. Let me remind you of the residue theorem. Suppose f is a function that's analytic except for an isolated singularity. So that means f is analytic in a puncture disk centered at c0 with the exception of c0. In that case, f has a Laurent series representation in that puncture disk, which is a doubly infinite series of terms ak, these are coefficients, times c minus 0 to the k, where k runs from negative infinity to positive infinity. We say the residue of f at c0 is the a minus 1 term. This is the term for which k is equal to minus 1, and that is the coefficient of the 1 over z minus c0 term. Let's start by finding residues at removable singularities. Recall that a removable singularity is a singularity for which you find out that after finding the Laurent series, there are actually no terms that have negative powers of c minus c0. So all the a's are actually equal to 0 for k less than 0. One well, particular, then a minus 1 must be equal to 0, which is the residue. So in that case, the residue of f at c0 is 0. Let's look at an example. The function sine z over z, sine z over z has an isolated singularity at the origin because that's what we're dividing by 0. Otherwise, the function is nullity. Sine z itself has a Taylor series representation centered at the origin, namely z minus z cubed over 3 factorial plus z to the fifth over 5 factorial and so forth, which you see right here. If I divide that by z, I find myself with 1 minus 1 over 3 factorial times z squared plus 1 over 5 factorial times z to the 4 and so forth. That's the Laurent series representation of sine z over z, which we use to show that z equals 0 is actually a removable singularity for this function f. Therefore, the residue of f at 0 is equal to 0. Next, let's consider residues at simple poles. Recall that z0 is a simple pole if the a minus 1 term in the Laurent series representation is non zero, but all other a's or k's less than negative 1 are equal to 0. So there's exactly one negative power of z minus c0 in the Laurent series expansion. So f has the form a minus 1 divided by z minus c0, and then all non negative powers of z minus c0. How do we find this a minus 1 term? Here's the idea. We multiply through by z minus c0. If we multiply both sides of the equation by z minus c0, we find that z minus c0 times f of z is z minus c0 times a minus 1 over z minus c0, so that's just a minus 1, and then each term is an additional z minus c0, so a0 times z minus c0, a1 times z minus c0 squared, and so forth. Now we find that z approach c0 and take the limit, then as z approaches c0, this term goes away, this term goes away, and all I'm left with is this term right here. So the residue of f at c0 can be found by taking the limit as z approaches c0 of z minus c0 times f of z. Let's see if we can use that in an example. Let's look at f of z equals 1 over z squared plus 1. We've already looked at this function before. We know it has simple poles and c0 equals i and c0 equals negative i. We'll focus on i right now and try to find the residue at c0 equals i. By our formula, we can find that residue by first multiplying the function f by z minus i. That's what you see right here. You multiply f by z minus i. And then we need to take the limit as z approaches i. But 1 over z squared plus 1 is actually equal to 1 over z minus i times z plus i, because we can factor the denominator. The z minus i in the denominator cancels out the z minus i, so that we're left with simply 1 over z plus i. The limit as z approaches i of that fraction can be found easily by simply plugging in i for z. And if I plug in i for z, I get 1 over 2i. And 1 over 2i is the same thing as negative i over 2. So the residue of this function at i is negative i over 2. That's the same residue we found last class with a very different method. Next, let's look at double poles. A double pole is one for which the a minus 2 term is non zero, but all further a k's where k less than or equal to negative 3 are equal to 0. So f has the form a minus 2 over z minus 0 squared, then maybe there's an a minus 1 term or not, and then all the rest of the terms are non negative powers of z minus 2 squared. How do we isolate a negative 1? The idea is very similar. This time we multiply through by z minus 0 squared, the largest denominator we have. So z minus c0 squared times f of z gives us a minus 2, and the a minus 1 term gets an extra z minus c0, a0 gets a z minus c0 squared, and so forth. We can't simply let z approach c0 because if we did that, we would isolate a negative 2. But we're not interested in a negative 2, we're interested in a negative 1. That's why we have an additional trait right here. We take a derivative. If we take a derivative of this equation, then the a minus 2 term goes away. We're left with an a minus 1 term. The derivative of a0 times z minus c0 squared is 2a0 times z minus c0, and all the subsequent terms have some power of z minus c0. Now, if we let z approach c0, all these subsequent terms go away, and we're left with a negative 1. So we found a formula. For double poles, the residue of the double pole can be found by first multiplying the function by z minus c0 squared, and then taking the derivative, and then taking the limit as z approaches c0. Let's look at an example. Let's look at f of z equals 1 over z minus 1 squared times z minus 3. That function has a double pole at c0 equals 1. It has a simple pole at 3, but we're not interested in that pole right now. We want to find the residue of f at 1. By our formula, we need to multiply this function by z minus 1 squared. That's what's happening right here. Then we need to take a derivative, and finally the limit as z approaches 1. We see right away multiplying by z minus 1 squared is very convenient because the z minus 1 squared term will simply cancel out. So that we're left with having to find the derivative of 1 over z minus 3 and then the limit as z approaches 1. But the derivative of 1 over z minus 3 is minus 1 over z minus 3 squared. And the limit of that as z approaches 1, we simply have to plug in 1 for z. 1 minus 3 is negative 2, negative 2 squared is 4. And so that the residue of our function at 1 is negative 1 fourth. Let's try to generalize these ideas. Suppose now we're dealing with a pole of order n. That means the a minus n term is non-zero. And all other a k's are k less than or equal to negative n plus 1. Those are equal to 0. So my function looks like this. I have a minus n over z minus c 0 to the n. And then terms where the denominator gets better and better, all the way through a minus 1 over z minus c 0, and then the non-negative powers of z minus c 0. The idea is the same thing. We're going to multiply through by z minus c0 to the n, and if I do that, I'm left with a minus n plus a minus n plus 1 times c minus c0, all the way through a minus 1 times c minus c0 to the n minus 1 plus a0 times c minus c0 to the n, and so forth. I want to isolate the a minus 1 term. So I can't simply let z approach c0. I need to isolate this term, and therefore I need to take an n minus 1 fold derivative. If I take a derivative of n minus 1 times, this z minus c0 to the n minus 1 will go away. All these terms in the front will also go away under differentiation, and only terms to the right will be left. So if I differentiate this n minus 1 times, I find the following. The first time I take the derivative of the a minus 1 term, I get an n minus 1 from the exponent, then a minus 1 times c minus c0 to the n minus 2. The next time I differentiate, I get the factor n minus 2 up from, and so forth. If I differentiate n minus 1 times, the z minus c0 term is gone entirely, and I have n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3, and so forth, all the way down to 1 times a minus 1 term. 
The A0 term also has all kinds of things up front here, but it has a z minus z0 term left, and so do all the subsequent terms. Now, if I let z approach c0, all these subsequent terms will go away. So if I now take a limit as z approaches c0, then I can isolate my i minus 1 term if I simply divide by this number right here, which happens to be n minus 1 factorial. So we just found the following formula. The residue of f at a polar order n is 1 over n minus 1 factorial, hence the limit as z approaches c0 of the n minus 1 fold derivative of z minus c0 to the n times f of c. This formula clearly contains the two cases that we already considered earlier, the simple pool and the double pool, but now you can use it for higher order folds as well. To finish, I want to show you one other very useful little fact. Suppose you have a function f that is a quotient of two analytic functions, g and h, where h, the denominator, has a simple zero at c0. Then the residue of f at c0 can simply be found by taking g, the numerator function, evaluated at c0, and dividing that by the denominator derivative at c0. Let's get back to the example that we looked at when we looked at a double pool. f of z equals 1 over z minus 1 squared z minus 3 has a double pool at 1, but also a simple pool at 3. This time we want to find the residue at 3. We can look at this function as the function 1 over z minus 1 squared divided by the function z minus 3. The function g, which is 1 over z minus 1 squared, has an isolated singularity of 1, but is always analytic. So in particular, near 3, it's very much analytic. For example, if I look at a little disk around 3, in that disk, the function g is entirely analytic. The function h of z, which is z minus 3, is also analytic. It's analytic everywhere. It has a simple 0 at 3. By the fact, we can therefore find the residue of the function f, which is g divided by h, by simply plugging in 3 into g and plugging in 3 into the derivative of h. Well, g of 3 is 1 over 3 minus 1 squared. 3 minus 1 is negative 2 squared, that's 4, so this is 1 4. And h prime of 3 is equal to 1 because the derivative of h is simply equal to 1 over here. Therefore, the residue of this function f at c0 is 1 4. We could have just as well found the residue of f using the fact that 3 is a simple pool. We could have applied that formula. The calculation would have been quite similar. This is just another way of finding residues. In the next lecture, we'll use the residue theorem to find some interesting integrals.